What's up guys, my name is Connor and welcome to the Songwriter Sanctuary. Today we're going to be talking about Simon and Garfunkel. I'm just going to make the bold assumption that if you clicked on this video you probably know who they are, but just in case, Simon and Garfunkel is a folk rock duo from New York City consisting of Paul Simon and Art Garfunkel. They're very aptly named. Their sound was largely driven by Paul Simon's wistful and exploratory guitar work, as well as his unique and literary lyrical style. Eh, say that five times fast. The duo were also renowned for the way that their harmonies blended. They met in school when they were just a 11, 12 years old, and they spent much of their formative musical years learning how to sing alongside each other. So by the time they started releasing music, their chemistry was time-tested and undeniable. Over the course of the late 1960s, they lobbed hit after hit at the Billboard charts. Mrs. Robinson, Bridge Over Troubled Water, America, The Boxer, a version of the classic English folk song Scarborough Fair. But there was one song that kick-started it all, and that's the song we're going to be talking about today. So let's get into it. So the song we'll be analyzing is, you guessed it, the Sound of Silence. Hello, darkness, my old friend. It was originally recorded and released in 1964, and it was the song that put Simon and Garfunkel on the map, but maybe not in the way you'd expect. In this video, we're going to break down the lyrics, the melody, the chord progression, the instrumentation, and if you stick around to the end, I'll tell you the story of how the duo's producer accidentally screwed over Paul Simon during the making of the song, and how his actions actually propelled Simon and Garfunkel into superstardom. So let's start with the lyrics. Lyrically, this song is the epitome of Paul Simon's introspective and whimsical lyrical style. The song starts with the iconic line, Hello darkness, my old friend, I've come to talk with you again. Hello darkness, my old friend. And this line was literal. Paul Simon wrote it while sitting in his bathroom in the dark with his guitar. He spoke in a 1984 interview about how he used to go into the bathroom, turn off all the lights, turn the faucet on, close his eyes, and just play. Apparently the sound of the faucet was soothing to him. He really liked how the reverb of the guitar sounded with the bathroom tile, and the setting allowed him to just fall into a trance while he explored new ideas. So it began with him literally talking to the darkness in his bathroom, and then from there expanded into a much more intricate and abstract song. The central theme of the lyrics was alienation. It was a mood that enveloped the counterculture movement of the 1960s. A lot of the youth in that era, in the wake of the civil rights movement and the advent of the Vietnam War, found themselves separating from a more traditional and conservative American culture, and instead forging their own cultural identity. But it was lonely. As they moved away from the lifestyle of traditional American society, they found themselves isolated from it. The result of this was an absolute explosion of creativity, beautiful art, and intriguing new ideas in the late 1960s and early 70s. But at the same time, there was this sense of alienation that plagued the counterculture's participants as they moved farther and further away from the traditional American mainstream. As far as the specific message of the song, Paul Simon has always shied away from offering up a specific explanation about the events or circumstances that led to this song's lyrics. However, Art Garfunkel reportedly once said that the song is about people's inability to communicate with each other on an emotional level. Although, I couldn't find a reputable source for that quote, so take it with a grain of salt. Because of the intentional vagueness of the lyrics and the minimal explanation from Paul Simon, though, there's a lot of room for interpretation within the song's lyrics. Many people have interpreted the lyrics as describing a technological isolation, or how the modern technological age drives us away from our human roots and ultimately each other. This is reinforced by lines such as, My eyes were stabbed by the flash of a neon light that split the night and touched the sound of silence. My eyes were stabbed by the Neon and you also have the line, the people bowed and prayed to the neon god they make. And the people bowed and prayed. The reiteration of the neon light, or the artificial light, lends a little bit of credence to the theories about the song being technologically driven. Another popular interpretation is that as society gets busier and noisier, it becomes much harder to find a true meaning and connection. There becomes more noise that you have to filter out in order to connect with the world around you on a fundamental level. You have lines such as, people talking without speaking, people hearing without listening. People hearing without listening. And also the line, my words like silent raindrops fell and echoed in the wells of silence. But my words like silent raindrops fell. There's so many ways to interpret the lyrics of this song, and I'd love to hear what your interpretation is, so let me know down in the comments below what do you think this song means. Regardless of the interpretation, the silence does seem to represent people's disconnection from each other. And in the song, it grows and festers, and eventually becomes this revered entity that no one is willing to tamper with. This idea is made manifest in the very blunt line, and no one dared disturb the sound of silence. No one dared disturb the sound. 
The amazing thing about the lyrics is because they focus more on capturing the mood and emotion of the time than they do on honing in on a hyper-specific message, all of these interpretations can be true at once under the umbrella of the silence metaphor. However you split it, there's a lot of depth here, and viewed through the context of its time, the emotion embedded in the lyrics becomes even more powerful. So now let's talk about the musical components of this song. This song is in the key of G-flat. So what Paul Simon did was he put his capo on fret 6 of his guitar and played as if he were playing in the key of C. The chord progression is very simple. It's comprised of only four chords. The one, the four, the five, and the sixth chord in the key of G-flat. These are the four most common chords in contemporary music, so there's really nothing that special or interesting going on with the chord progression. Instead, the real magic of this song's musicality is found within its form and its structure. The song follows AAA or strophic form, meaning that the body of the song is just one central idea that repeats itself again and again. There's no distinction between verses and choruses and bridges, etc. It's just one elongated set of verses, which is hard to do. It's a common trope in folk music, but but it's hard to do because those ideas can get stale really quickly. Outside of that, the only deviation from that form is the intro and the outro, which are very similar ideas, just a light finger-picking rhythm over the sixth chord in the key. Once you get into the body of the song, though, the structure is strange. The song is technically in 4-4 time, but it really doesn't align with the conventional structure of four bars to a phrase. It's actually kind of difficult to parse out how this song is structured, but I did the best I could. It looks like this. You'll notice these parentheses at the end of the second line. These two beats are optional. Paul Simon added them in when they were necessary for the cadence of the lyrics, but he didn't bother with them if they weren't. So here's an example. In verse 3, you do have the extra couple beats. Song. But in verse 1, for example, you don't. And the, the thing about this change is it's so subtle and elegant that you really don't even notice. And that's interesting because it's usually very hard to add or remove beats from a measure without it being super noticeable. So the vocal melody is also a highlight of the song's musicality. The first roughly two-thirds or so of the vocal melody is built completely around ascending arpeggios, which is broken chord shapes moving upwards. We start with a six chord arpeggio that lands on the two. Hello, darkness, my old friend. Then we have a five chord arpeggio that lands on the one. I've come to talk with you again. Then we have a pair of one chord arpeggios that go one, three, five, up to the six, back down to the five. Because a vision softly creeping. At the conclusion of the arpeggios, we climb the scale all the way up to the high one, which is sort of like the apex or the high point of the verse. That was planted in my brain. Over the next couple bars, the melody falls all the way down over an octave until it lands on the word silence on the six. Actually, there's one major exception to that descending vocal line, and that is the word sound. On the sound of silence, you jump from the one to the five. The and then it immediately jumps back down. Of silence. The word sound goes up as if to signify there's hope of there actually being sound, but then those hopes are immediately dashed with the fall back down to silence. No sound to be found here. Speaking of sound, as far as the sound and the instrumentation of the song, Paul Simon said that the song was inspired in part by sounds he'd heard out and about in New York, on street corners and coffee shops, as the folk wave of the 1960s was emerging. I was influenced by street corner singing, by the folk movement. In the early 60s, I used to come into Manhattan and come and hang around in the clubs. The original version was very simple. It was just a couple acoustic guitar layers, you have Paul Simon and Art Garfunkel's harmonies panned wide left and right, and there's a double bass, and that's really about it. The song doesn't need much, it kind of stands on its own. It's simple and effective. However, if you go looking for the song, that might not be the version you find, and this is where the story gets really interesting. So the simple acoustic version of the song was released in 1964, but the song's producer, Tom Wilson, was really into the electric folk rock sound of the mid-1960s. And with Without informing either Paul Simon or Art Garfunkel, he went behind their backs and created a version of the song with drums and electric guitars and an electric bass. 
This was an attempt to capitalize on that folk rock boom that was taking place at that time. This production breathed new life into the song and it suddenly rocketed up to number one on the Billboard charts in 1966. But at this point, Paul Simon didn't know that Tom Wilson had done this. Art Garfunkel did. Columbia Records had invited him into the studio to hear the new version. But Paul was in England at the time working on another project. So when Paul first heard the electric version, he was apparently horrified. Art Garfunkel, however, kind of embraced it. He was just happy the song was picking up steam and giving the duo a chance to have their time in the limelight. It's easy to see both sides of the story here. Like, yeah, Tom Wilson probably should have let Paul and Art know that he was remixing the song. But ironically, the acoustic version of the song has had a truly lasting shelf life for the last 60 years. And it might never have made it into the public zeitgeist if Tom Wilson hadn't taken that creative risk. And who knows, Simon and Garfunkel might have just remained in obscurity, and maybe we would never have had all of their future hits, which were part of the defining backbone of the folk rock sound of the late 60s. If you listen to the electric version, you'll notice two oddities right away in verse 1. Number 1, there's a very twangy sounding electric guitar mirroring the acoustic guitar in the background. Number 2, Paul and Art's widely panned vocals are squashed together right dead center in the middle of the track. Oh darkness, my old friend. In verse 2, the drums and the bass and additional electric guitar layers come in. Restless dreams I walked alone. And in typical 1960s folk rock fashion, the drums are panned all the way left for some reason. It's a bold and unusual choice from a modern context, but it characterizes a lot of the sound of that era. Bands like the Beach Boys, Beatles, and a lot of other folk and rock bands of the time were doing very similar things. Personally, I prefer the acoustic version, but I don't mind the electric version. They both offer completely different emotional landscapes as a backdrop for the lyrics. The acoustic version feels a little more melancholy and defeatist, while the electric version has more of a sense of angst and urgency. The song has remained immensely popular over time, with many, many people covering covering it and doing their own versions. My favorite of these is the cover by the metal band Disturbed that they released in 2015. Now granted, I'm biased. I was a huge rock and metal fan as a kid, and Disturbed was one of my favorite bands in high school. But I think the intensity and emotion in singer David Draymond's voice is the perfect fit for this song. So that's about it. If I missed anything important while analyzing the song, please let me know in the comments down below. And I'd also love to hear your suggestions for songs and bands that I should cover in the future. Otherwise, I hope you have a wonderful day, and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.